Chapter Twenty of The Precipice by Ivan Goncharov, translated by M. Bryant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Vera came that night to supper with a gloomy face. She eagerly drank a glass of milk, but offered no remark to anyone. Why are you so unhappy, Verochka? asked her aunt. Don't you feel well? I was afraid to ask, interposed Tit Nikonich politely. I could not help noticing, Vera Vasilievna, that you have been altered for some time. You seem to have grown thinner and paler. The change becomes your looks, but the symptoms ought not to be overlooked, as they might indicate the approach of illness. I have a little toothache, but it will soon pass, answered Vera unwillingly. Tatiana Markovna looked away sadly enough, but said nothing while Raisky tapped his plate absently with a fork, but ate nothing and maintained a gloomy silence. Only Marfinka and Vikentiev took every dish that was offered them, and chattered without intermission. Vera soon took her leave, followed by Raisky. She went into the park and stood at the top of the cliff, looking down into the dark wood below her. Then she wrapped herself in her mantilla, and sat down on the bench. Silently she acceded to Raisky's request to be allowed to sit down beside her. You are in trouble and suffering, Vera. I have toothache. It is your heart that aches, Vera. Share your trouble with me. I make no complaint. You have an unhappy love affair. With whom? She did not answer. She knew that her hopes were still not dead, mad though they might be. What if she went away for a week or two to breathe, to conjure up her strength? Cousin, she said at last, tomorrow at daybreak I am going across the Volga and may stay away longer than usual. I have not said good-bye to grandmother. Please say it for me. I will go away too. Wait, cousin, until I am a little calmer. Perhaps then I can confide in you and we can part like brother and sister, but now it is impossible. Still, in case you do go away, let us say good-bye now. Forgive me my strange ways, and let me give you a sister's kiss. She kissed him on the forehead and walked quickly away. But she had only taken a few steps before she paused to say, Thank you for all you have done for me. I have not the strength to tell you how grateful I am for your friendship, and above all for this place. Farewell, and forgive me. Vera, he cried in painful haste, let me stay as long as you are here or are in the neighborhood. Even if we don't see one another, I yet know where you are. I will wait till you are calmer, till you fulfill your promise and confide in me, as you have said you would. You won't be far away, and we can at least write to one another. Give me at least this consolation, for God's sake, he murmured passionately. Leave me at least that paradise which is next door to hell. She looked at him with a distraught air and bent her head in assent. But she saw the glow of delight which swept over his agitated face and wondered sorrowfully why he did not speak like that. I will put off my journey till the day after tomorrow. Good night, she said, and gave him her hand to kiss before they separated. Early next day Vera gave Marina a note, with instructions to deliver it and to wait for the answer. After the receipt of the answer she grew more cheerful and went out for a walk along the riverside. That evening she told her aunt that she was going on a visit to Natalia Ivanovna, and took leave of them all, promising Raisky not to forget him. The next day a fisherman from the Volga brought him a letter from Vera, in which she called him dear cousin, and seemed to look forward to a happier future. Into the friendly tone of the letter he contrived to read a tender feeling, and he forgot in his delight his doubts, his anxiety, the blue letters, and the precipice. He wrote and dispatched immediately a brief, affectionate reply. Vera's letter aroused in him 
the artist sense and drove him to set out his chaotic emotions in defined form he sought to crystallize his thoughts and affections his very passion took artistic shape and assumed in the clear light vera's charming features what are you scribbling day and night inquired tatiana markovna is it a play or another novel i write and write granny and don't know myself how it will end it doesn't matter what the child does so long as he is amused she remarked not altogether missing the character of raisky's occupation but why do you write at night when i am so afraid of fire and you might fall asleep over your drama you will make yourself ill and you often look as yellow as an overripe gherkin as it is he looked in the glass and was struck with his own appearance yellow patches were visible on the nose and temples and there were grey threads in his thick black hair if i were fair he grumbled i should not age so quickly don't bother about me granny but leave me my freedom i can't sleep you too ask me for freedom like vera it is as if i held you both in chains she added with an anxious sigh go on writing bodushka but not at night i cannot sleep in peace for when i look at your window the light is always burning i will answer for it grandmother that there shall be no fire and if i myself were to be burnt touch wood do not tempt fate remember the saying that my tongue is my enemy suddenly raisky sprang from the divan and ran to the window there is a peasant bringing a letter from vera he cried as he hurried out of the room one might think it was his father in person said tatiana markovna to herself how many candles he burns with his novels and plays as many as four in a night again raisky received a few lines from vera she wrote that she was longing to see him again and that she wanted to ask for his services she added the following postscript dear friend and cousin you taught me to love and to suffer and poured the strength of your love into my soul this it is that gives me courage to ask you to do a good deed there is here an unhappy man who has been driven from his home and lies under the suspicion of the government he has no place to lay his head and every one either from indifference or fear avoids him but you are kind and generous and cannot be indifferent still less will you hesitate to do a deed of pure charity the wretched man has not a kopeck has no clothes and autumn is coming on if your heart tells you as i don't doubt it will what to do address the wife of the acolyte sekletea burdalakhov but arrange it so that neither grandmother nor any one at home knows anything of it a sum of three hundred roubles will be sufficient i think to provide for him for a whole year perhaps two hundred and fifty would suffice will you put in a cloak and a warm vest in my firm belief in your kind heart and your love to me i enclose the measures taken by the village tailor to protect him from the cold I don't like to ask you for a rug for him. That would be to make an unfair use of kindness. In the winter the poor exile will probably leave the place and will bless you and to some degree me as well. I would not have troubled you, but you know that my grandmother has all my money, which is therefore inaccessible. What on earth is the meaning of this postscript? cried Raisky the whole note is certainly not from her hand she could not have written like this he threw himself on the divan in a fit of nervous laughter he was in tatiana markovna's sitting-room with vikentiev and marfinka at first the lovers laughed but stopped when they saw the violent character of his mirth tatiana markovna who came in at this moment offered him some drops of cordial in a teaspoon no grandmother 
he cried, still laughing violently. Don't give me drops, but three hundred roubles. What do you want the money for? said Tatiana Markovna, hesitating. Is it for Markushka again? You had much better ask him to return the eighty roubles he has had. He entered into the spirit of the bargain, and eventually had to content himself with two hundred and fifty roubles, which he dispatched next day to the address given. He also ordered the cloak and vest, and bought a warm rug to be sent in a few days. I thank you heartily, and with tears, dear cousin, ran the letter he received in return for his gifts. I cannot express in writing the gratitude I feel. Heaven, not I, will reward you. How delighted the poor exile was with your gifts! He laughed for joy and is wearing the new things. He immediately paid his landlord his three months' arrears of rent and a month in advance. He only allowed himself to spend three roubles in cigars, which he has not smoked for a long time, and smoking is his only passion. Although the apocryphal nature of this remarkable missive was quite clear to Raisky, he did not hesitate to add a box of cigars to his gift for the poor exile. It was enough for him that Vera's name was attached to this pressing request. He observed the course of his own passion as a physician does disease. As he watched the clouds driven before the wind, or looked at the green carpet of the earth, now taking on sad autumnal hues, he realized that nature was marching on her way through never-ending change, with not a moment's stagnation. He alone brooded idly, with no prize in view. He asked himself anxiously what his duty was, and begged that reason would shed some light on his way, give him boldness to leap over the funeral pyre of his hopes. Reason told him to seek safety in flight. He drove into the town to buy some necessities for the journey, and there met the governor, who reproached him with having hidden himself for so long. Raisky excused himself on the ground of ill health, and spoke of his approaching departure. Uh, where are you going? It is all one to me, returned Raisky gloomily. Here I am so bored that I must seek some distraction. I intend going to St. Petersburg, then to my estate in the government of R, and then perhaps abroad. I don't wonder that you are bored with staying in the same spot since you avoid society and must need distraction will you make an expedition with me i am starting on a tour of the district to-morrow why not come with me you will see much that is beautiful and being a poet you will collect new impressions we will travel for a hundred versts by river don't forget your sketch-book raisky shook the governor's proffered hand and accepted the governor showed him his well-equipped travelling carriage declared that his kitchen would travel with him, and cards should not be forgotten, and promised himself a gayer journey than would have been possible in the sole society of a busy secretary. Raisky felt a relief in the firm determination he now made to conquer his passion, and decided not to return from this journey, but to have his effects sent after him. While he was away, he wrote in this sense to Vera, telling her that his life in Malinovka had been like an evil dream full of suffering, and that if he ever saw the place again it would be at some distant date. A day or two later he received a short answer from Vera, dated from Malinovka. Marfinka's birthday fell during the next week, and when the festival was over she was to go on a long visit to her future mother-in-law. If Raisky did not make some sacrifice and return, a sacrifice to her grandmother and herself, Tatiana Markovna would be terribly lonely. Next evening he had a letter from Vera acquiescing in his intention of leaving Malinovka without seeing her again, and saying that immediately after the dispatch of this letter she would go over to her friend on the other side of the Volga. 
but she hoped that he would go to say good-bye to Tatiana Markovna and the rest of the household, as his departure without any farewell must necessarily cause surprise in the town and would hurt Tatiana Markovna's feelings. This answer relieved him enormously. On the afternoon of the next day, when he alighted from the carriage on the outskirts of the town and bade his travelling host good-bye, he was in good enough spirits as he picked up his bag and made his way to the house. Marfinka and Vikentiev were the first to meet him. The dogs leaped to welcome him, the servants hurried up, and the whole household showed such genuine pleasure at his return that he was moved almost to tears. He looked anxiously round to see if Vera was there, but one and another hastened to tell him that Vera had gone away. He ought to have been glad to hear this news, but he heard it with a spasm of pain. When he entered his aunt's room, she sent Pashutka out and locked the door. "'How anxiously I have been expecting you,' she said. "'I wanted to send a messenger for you.' "'What is the matter?' he exclaimed pale with terror in fears of bad news of Vera. "'Your friend Leonti Ivanovich is ill, poor fellow. What is wrong? Is it dangerous? I will go to him at once. I will have the horses put in. In the meantime, I may as well tell you what is known all over the town. I have kept it secret from Marfinka only, and Vera already knows it. His wife has left him, and he has fallen ill. Yesterday and the day before, the Kozlov's cook came to fetch you. Where has she gone? Away with the Frenchman Char, who was suddenly called to St. Petersburg. She pretended she was going to stay with her relations in Moscow, and said that Monsieur Char would accompany her so far she extracted from kozlov a pass giving her permission to live alone and is now with shah in st petersburg her relations with shah replied raisky were no secret to anybody except her husband every one will laugh at him but he will understand nothing and his wife will return you have not heard the end on her way she wrote to her husband, telling him to forget her, not to expect her return, because she could no longer endure living with him. The fool! Just as if she had not made scandal enough. Poor Leonti! I will go to him. How sorry I am for him! Yes, Vorushka, I am sorry for him too, and should like to have gone to see him. He has the simple honesty of a child. God has given him learning, but no common sense, and he is buried in his books. I wonder who is looking after him now. If you find he is not being properly cared for, bring him here. The old house is empty, and we can establish him there for the time being. I will have two rooms got ready for him. What a woman you are, grandmother! while i am thinking you have acted when he reached kozlov's house he found the shutters of the grey house were closed and he had to knock repeatedly before he was admitted he passed through the anteroom into the dining-room and stood uncertain before the study door hesitating whether he should knock or go straight in suddenly the door opened and there stood before him dressed in a woman's dressing-gown and slippers Mark Volokov, unbrushed, sleepy, pale, thin, and sinister. The evil one has brought you at last, he grumbled half in surprise and half in vexation. Where have you been all this time? I have hardly slept for two nights. His pupils are about in the daytime, but at night he is alone. What is the matter with him? Has no one told you? That she-goat has gone. I was pleased to hear it and came at once to congratulate him, but I found him with not a drop of blood in his face, with dazed eyes and unable to recognize anyone. He just escaped brain fever. 
instead of weeping for joy the man has nearly died of sorrow i fetched the doctor but kozlov sent him away and walked up and down the room like one demented now he is sleeping so we will not disturb him i will go and you must stay and see that he does not do himself some injury in a fit of melancholy he listens to no one and i have been tempted to smack him mark spit with vexation you can't depend on his idiot of a cook yesterday the woman gave him some tooth powder instead of his proper powder i'm going to dismiss her to-morrow raisky watched him in amazement and offered his hand what favour is this said mark bitterly and without taking the proffered hand i thank you for having stood by my old friend mark seized raisky's hand and shook it i have been looking for some means of serving you for a long time why volokov are you forever executing quick changes like a clown in a circus what the devil have i to do with your gratitude i'm not here for that but on kozlov's account god be with you and your manners mark ivanovitch replied raisky in any case you have done a good deed more praise you can be as sentimental as you like for all i care i will take leonti home with me resumed raisky he will be absolutely at home there and if his troubles do not blow over he will have his own quiet corner all his life bravo that is deeds not words kozlov would wither without a home and without care it is an excellent idea you have taken into your head it comes not from me but from a woman and not from her head but from her heart my aunt the old lady has a sound heart i must go and breakfast with her one day it is a pity she has amassed so many foolish ideas now i'm going look after kozlov if not personally through someone else the day before yesterday his head had to be cooled all day and at night cabbage leaves should be laid on it i was a little disturbed because in his dazed state he got the cabbage and began to eat it good-bye i have neither slept nor eaten though avdotya has treated me to a horrible brew of coffee allow me to send the coachman home to fetch some supper said raisky i would rather eat at home perhaps you have no money said raisky nervously drawing out his pocket-book i have money said mark enigmatically hardly able to restrain a callous laugh i am going to the bath-house before i have my supper as i haven't been able to undress here i have changed my quarters and now live with a clerical personage you look ill thin and your eyes mark's face grew more evil and sinister than before you too look worse he said if you look in the glass you will see yellow patches and hollow eyes i have many causes of anxiety so have i good-bye said mark and was gone raisky went into the study and walked up to the bed on tiptoe who is there asked leonti feebly when leonti recognized raisky he pushed his feet out of bed and sat up is he gone he asked weakly i pretended to be asleep you have not been for so long and i have been expecting you all the time the face of an old comrade is the only one that i can bear to see i have been away and heard when i returned of your illness it is gossip there is a conspiracy to say i am ill which is all foolish talk mark who even fetched a doctor has been hanging about here as if he were afraid i should do myself an injury said leonti and paced up and down the room you are weak and walk with difficulty said raisky it would be better for you to lie down i am weak that is true admitted leonti he bent over the chair back to raisky embraced him and laid his face against his hair Raisky felt hot tears on his forehead and cheeks. It is weakness, sobbed Leonti, but I am not ill, 
and have not brain fever they talk but don't understand and i understood nothing either but now that i see you i cannot keep back my tears don't abuse me like mark or laugh at me as they all do my colleagues and my sympathetic visitors i can discern malicious laughter on all their faces i respect and understand your tears and your sorrow said raisky stifling his own tears you are my kind old comrade even at school you never laughed at me and do you know why i weep leonti took a letter from his desk and handed it to raisky it was the letter from yuliana andreevna of which tatiana markovna had spoken raisky glanced through it destroy it he said you will have no peace while it is in your possession destroy it said leonti seizing the letter and replacing it in the desk how is it possible to think of such a thing when these are the only lines she has written me and these are all that i have as a souvenir leonti think of all this as a malady a terrible misfortune and don't succumb to it you are not an old man and have a long life before you my life is over unless she returns to me he whispered what you could you would take her back you too boris fail to understand me cried leonti in despair as he thrust his hands into his hair and strode up and down people keep on saying i am ill they offer sympathy bring a doctor sit all night by my bedside and yet don't guess why i suffer so wildly don't even guess at the only remedy there is for me she is not here he whispered wildly seizing raisky by the shoulders and shaking him violently she is not here and that is what constitutes my illness besides i am not ill i am dead take me to her and i shall rise again and you ask whether i will take her back again you a novelist don't understand simple things like that i did not know that you loved her like that said raisky tenderly you used to laugh and say that you had got so used to her that you were becoming faithless to your greeks and romans i chatted i boasted laughed leonti bitterly and i was without understanding but for this i never should have understood i thought i loved the ancients while my whole love was given to the living woman yes boris i loved books and my gymnasium the ancients and the moderns my scholars and you boris i loved the street this hedge the service tree there only through my love for her now nothing of all this matters i knew that as i lay on the floor reading her letter and you ask whether i would receive her god in heaven if she came how she should be cherished he concluded his tears flowing once more leonti i come to you with a request from tatiana markovna who asks you he went on though leonti walked ceaselessly up and down dragging his slippers and appearing not to listen to come over to us here you will die of misery oh, thank you said leonti shaking his head she is a saint but how can a desolate man carry his sorrow into a strange house not a strange house leonti we are brothers and our relation is closer than the ties of blood leonti lay down on the bed and took raisky's hand pardon my egoism he said later later i will come of my own accord will ask permission to look after your library if no hope is left me have you any hope 
what do you think there is no hope raisky who did not wish to deprive his friend of the last straw nor to stir useless hope in him hesitated before he answered after a pause i don't know what to say to you exactly leonti i know so little of your wife that i cannot judge her character you know her said leonti in a dull voice it was you who directed my attention to the frenchman but then i did not understand you because nothing of the kind had entered my head but if he leaves her he said with a gleam of hope in his eyes she will perhaps remember me perhaps said raisky to-morrow i will come to fetch you good-bye for the present to-night i will either come myself or send someone who will stay with you leonti did not hear and did not even see raisky go when he reached home raisky gave his aunt an account of leonti's condition telling her that there was no danger but that no sympathy would help matters Jakob was sent to look after the sick man and tatiana markovna did not forget to send an abundant supper with tea rum wine and all sorts of other things what are these things for grandmother asked raisky he doesn't eat anything but the other one if he returns what other one who but markushka he will want something to eat you found him with our invalid i will go to mark granny and tell him what you say for goodness sake don't do that borushka mark will laugh at me no he will be grateful and respectful for he understands you he is not like neil andreevich i don't want his gratitude and respect let him eat and be satisfied and god be with him he is a ruined man has he remembered the eighty roubles end of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of the precipice by ivan goncharov translated by m bryant this librivox recording is in the public domain raisky laughed as he went out into the garden he looked sadly at the closed shutters of the old house and stood for a long time on the edge of the precipice looking down thoughtfully into the depths of the thicket and the trees rustling and cracking in the wind then he turned to look at the long avenues here forming gloomy corridors and then opening out into open stately spaces at the flower gardens now fading under the approach of autumn at the kitchen garden and at the distant glimmer of the rising moon and at the stars he looked out over the volga gleaming like steel in the distance the evening was fresh and cool and the withered leaves were falling with a gentle rustle around him he could not take his eyes from the river now silvered by the moon which separated him from vera she had gone without leaving a word for him a word from her would have brought tenderness and would have drowned all bitterness he thought but she was gone without leaving a trace of any kind remembrance with bent head and full of anxious thought he made his way along the dark avenues suddenly delicate fingers seized his shoulders and he heard a low laugh vera he cried seizing her hand violently you here and not away over the volga yes here not over there she put her arm in his and asked him laughing whether he thought she would let him go without saying good-bye which he said not knowing whether fear or joy was uppermost i was this very moment complaining that you had not left a line for me and now i can't understand as everyone in the house told me you had gone away yesterday and you believed it she said laughing i told them to say so to surprise you they were humbugging to go away without two words she asked triumphantly or to stay which is better her gay talk 
her quick gestures the mockery in her voice all these things seemed unnatural and he recognized beneath it all weariness strain an effort to conceal the collapse of her strength when they reached the end of the avenue he tried to lead her to an open spot where he could see her face let me look at you how gay and merry you are vera he said timidly what is there to see she interrupted impatiently and tried to draw him into the shadow again he felt that her hands were trembling and for the moment his own passion was stilled and he shared her suffering why do you look at me like that i'm not crazy she said turning her face away he was stricken with horror the insane are always assuring every one of their sanity what was wrong with vera she did not confide in him she would not speak out she was determined to fight her own battles who could support and shelter her an inner voice told him that tatiana markovna alone could do it vera you are ill he said earnestly give grandmother your confidence silence not a word of grandmother good-bye to-morrow we will go for a stroll do some shopping go down by the river anything you like i will go away vera he cried filled with inexpressible fear i am worn out why do you deceive me why did you call me back to find you still here was it to mock my sufferings so that we could suffer together she answered passion is beautiful as you yourself have said it is life itself you have taught me how to love have educated passion in me and now you may admire the result of your labor she ended drawing in a deep breath of the cool evening air i warned you vera i told you passion was a fierce wolf no worse it is a tiger i could not believe what you said but i do now do you know the picture in the old house which represents a tiger showing his teeth at a seated cupid i never understood the picture which seemed meaningless but now i understand it passion is a tiger lying there apparently so peaceful and inviting until he begins to howl and to wet his teeth raisky pursued the comparison in the hope that he might learn the name of vera's lover your comparison is false vera there are no tigers in our northern climate i am nearer the mark when i compare passion to a wolf you are right she said with a nervous laugh a real wolf however carefully you feed him he looks always to the woods you are all wolves and he too is a wolf who he asked in an expressionless voice tushin is a bear a genuine russian bear you may lay your hand on his shaggy head and sleep your rest is sure for he will serve you all his life which of the animals am i he asked gaily noting that tushin was not the man don't beat about the bush vera you may say i'm an ass no she said scornfully you are a fox a nice cunning fox with a gift for deception that's what you are why don't you say something she went on as he kept an embarrassed silence vera there are weapons to be used against wolves for me to go away for you not to go down there he said pointing to the precipice tell me how to prevent myself from going there teach me since you are my mentor how not to go you first set the house on fire and then talk of leaving it you sing in praise of passion and then i meant another kind of passion where both parties to it are honourable it means the supreme happiness in life and its storms are full of the glow of life and where there is no dishonour no precipice yawns i love and am loved yet passion has me in its jaws tell me what i should do confess all to grandmother whispered raisky pale with terror or permit me to talk to her to shame me and ruin me who told me i need not obey her at one moment you are on the point of telling your secret 
at another you hide behind it i am in the dark and feel my way in uncertainty how can i when i do not know the whole truth diagnose the case you know what is wrong with me why do you say you are in the dark come she said leading him into the moonlight see what is wrong with me he stood transfixed with terror and pity pale haggard with wild eyes and tightly pressed lips this was quite another vera strands of hair were loose from beneath her hood and fell in gypsy-like confusion over her forehead and temples and covered her eyes and mouth with every quick movement she made her shoulders were negligently clad in a satin wrap trimmed with swan's down held in place by a loosely tied knot of silk well she said shaking her hair out of her eyes what has happened to the beauty whose praise you sang vera he said i would die for you tell me how i may serve you die she exclaimed help me to live give me that beautiful passion which sheds its glorious light over the whole of life i see no passion but this drowning tiger passion give me back at least my old strength you who talk of going to my grandmother to place her and me on the same bier it is too late to tell me to go no more to the precipice she sat down on the bench and looked moodily straight before her you yourself vera dreamed of freedom and you prided yourself on your independence my head burns have pity on your sister i am ashamed to be so weak what is it dear vera nothing take me home help me to mount the steps i am afraid and would like to lie down pardon me for having disturbed you for nothing for having brought you here you would have gone away and forgotten me i am only feverish are you angry with me too dejected to reply he gave her his arm took her as far as her room and struck a light send marina or masha to stay in my room please but say nothing to grandmother lest she should be alarmed and come herself why are you looking at me so strangely god knows what i have been saying to you to plague you and to avenge myself of all my humiliations tell grandmother that i have gone to bed to be up early in the morning and i pray you bless me in your thoughts do you hear i hear he said absently as he pressed her hand and went out in search of marcia he looked forward with anxiety to vera's awakening he seemed to have forgotten his own passion since his imagination had become absorbed in the contemplation of her suffering something is wrong with vera said tatiana markovna shaking her grey head as she saw how grimly he avoided her questioning glance ah, what can it be asked raisky negligently with an effort to assume indifference something is wrong borushka she looks so melancholy and is so silent and often seems to have tears in her eyes i have spoken to the doctor but he only talks the old nonsense about nerves she said relapsing into a gloomy silence raisky looked anxiously for vera's appearance next morning she came at last accompanied by the maid who carried a warm coat and her hat and shoes she said good morning to her aunt asked for coffee ate her roll with appetite and reminded raisky that he had promised to go shopping with her in the town and to take a walk in the park it amazed him that she should be once more transformed but there was a certain audacity in her gestures and a haste in her speech which seemed forced and alien from her usual manner and reminded him of her behaviour the day before she was plainly making a great effort to conceal her real mood she chatted volubly with polina karpovna who had turned up unexpectedly and was displaying the pattern of a dress intended for marfinka's trousseau the lady's visit was really directed towards raisky of whose return she had heard she sought in vain an occasion to speak with him alone but seized a moment to sit down beside him 
when she made eyes at him and said in a low voice, Je comprends. Dites tu. Du courage. Raisky wished her anywhere and moved away. Vera, meanwhile, put on her coat and asked him to come with her. Polina Karpovna wished to accompany them but Vera declined on the ground that they were walking and had far to go, that the ground was damp, and that Polina's elegant dress with a long train was unsuited for the expedition. "'I want to have you this whole day for myself,' she said to Raisky as they went out together. "'Indeed, every day until you go.' "'But, Vera, how can I help you when I don't know what is making you suffer?' I only see that you have your own drama, that a catastrophe is approaching or is in process. What is it? He asked anxiously as she shivered. I don't feel well and am far from gay. Autumn is beginning. Nature grows dark and sinister. The birds are already deserting us and my mood too is autumnal. Do you see the black line high above the Volga? those are the cranes in flight my thoughts too fly away into the distance she realized halfway that this strange explanation was unconvincing and only pursued it because she did not wish to tell the truth i wanted to ask you very about the letters you wrote to me i am ill and weak you saw what an attack i had yesterday i cannot remember just now all that i wrote another time then he sighed but tell me, Vera, how I can help you. Why do you keep me back, and why do you want to spend these days in my society? I have a right to ask this, and it is your duty to give a plain answer unless you want me to think you false. Don't let us talk of it now. No, he cried angrily. You play with me as a cat does with a mouse. I will endure it no longer. You can either reveal your own secrets or keep them as you please, but in so far as it touches me, I demand an immediate answer. What is my part in this drama? Do not be angry. I did not keep you back to wound you. But don't talk about it. Don't agitate me so that I have another attack like yesterday's. You see that I can hardly stand. I don't want my weakness to be seen at home defend me from myself come to me at dusk about six and i will tell you why i detained you pardon me vera i am not myself either he said struck by her suffering i don't know what lies in your heart and i will not ask i will come later to fetch you i will tell you if i have the strength she said they went into the shops where vera made purchases for herself and marfinka she talked eagerly to the acquaintances they met, and even visited a poor godchild for whom she took gifts. She assented readily to Raisky's suggestion that they should visit Kozlov. When they reached the house, Mark walked out of the door. He was plainly startled, made no answer to Raisky's inquiry after Leontie's health, and walked quickly away. Vera was still more disconcerted, but pulled herself together and followed Raisky into the house. "'What is the matter with him?' asked Raisky. He did not answer a word, but simply bolted. "'You were frightened, too, Vera. Is it Mark, who signalizes his presence at the foot of the precipice by a shot?' "'I have seen him wandering round with a gun,' he said, joking. She answered in the same tone, "'Of course, cousin!' But she did not look at him. "'No,' thought Raisky to himself. She could not have taken for her idol a wandering ragged gypsy like that. Then he wondered whether the possibility could be entirely excluded since passion wanders where he lists, and not in obedience to the convictions and dictates of man. He is invincible and master of his own inexplicable moods, but Vera had never had any opportunity of meeting Mark, he concluded and was merely afraid of him as every one else was. Leontie's condition was unchanged. He wandered about like a drunken man, silent and listening for the noise of any carriage in the street, 
when he would rush to the window to look if it bore his fugitive wife. He would come to them in a few weeks, he said, after Marfinka's wedding, as Vera suggested. Then he became aware of Vera's presence. Vera Vasilyevna, he cried in surprise, staring at her as he addressed Raisky. Do you know Boris Pavlovich? Who else has read your books and helped me to arrange them? Who has been reading my books? asked Raisky. But Leonti had been distracted by the sound of a passing carriage and did not hear the question. Vera whispered to Raisky that they should go. I wanted to say something, Boris Pavlovich, said Leonti thoughtfully, raising his head. But I can't remember what. You said someone else had been reading my books. Leonti pointed to Vera, who was looking out of the window, but who now pulled Raisky's sleeve. Come, she said, and they left the house. When they reached home, Vera made over some of her purchases to her aunt, and had others taken to her room. She asked Raisky to go out with her again in the park and down by the Volga. Why are you tiring yourself out, Vera? he asked as they went. You are weak. Air. I must have air, she exclaimed, turning her face to the wind. She is collecting all her strength, he thought, as they entered the room where the family was waiting for them for dinner. In the afternoon he slept for weariness and only awoke at twilight, when six o'clock had already struck. He went to find Vera, but Marina told him she had gone to Vespers. She did not know whether in the village church on the hill or in the church on the outskirts of the town. He went to the town church first, and after studying the faces of all the old women assembled there, he climbed the hill to the village church. Old people stood in the corners and by the door, and by a pillar in a dark corner knelt Vera, with a veil wrapped round her bowed head. He took his stand near her behind another pillar, and, engrossed in his thoughts of her state of mind, watched her intently as she prayed motionless, with her eyes fixed on the cross. He went sadly into the porch to wait for her, and there she joined him, putting her hand in his arm without a word. As they crossed the big meadow into the park, he thought of nothing but the promised explanation his own intense desire to be freed from his miserable uncertainty weighed with him less than his duty, as he conceived it, of shielding her, of illuminating her path with his experience, and of lending his undivided strength to keep her from overstepping her moral precipice. Perhaps it was merely a remnant of pride that prevented her from telling him why she had summoned him and detained him. He could not, and even if he could, he had not the right to share his apprehensions with anyone else. Even if he might confide in Tatiana Markovna, if he spoke to her of his suspicion and his surmises, he was not clear that it would help matters, for he feared that their aunt's practical but old-fashioned wisdom would be shattered on Vera's obstinacy. Vera possessed the bolder mind, the quicker will. She was level with contemporary thought, and towered above the society in which she moved. She must have derived her ideas and her knowledge from some source accessible to her alone. Though she took pains to conceal her knowledge, it was betrayed by a chance word, by the mention of a name or an authority in this or that sphere of learning, and it was betrayed also in her speech, in the remarkable aptness of the words in which she clothed her thoughts and feelings. In this matter she held so great an advantage over Tatiana Markovna that the old lady's efforts in argument were more likely to be disastrous than not. Undoubtedly, Tatiana Markovna was a wise woman with a correct judgment of the general phenomena of life. She was a famous housewife, ruling her little tsardom magnificently. She knew the ways, the vices, and the virtues of mankind as they are set out in the Ten Commandments, 
and the gospels but she knew nothing of the life where the passions rage and steep everything in their colors and even if she had known such a world in her youth an unshared passion or one stifled in its development not a stormy drama of love but rather a lyric tenderness which unfolded and perished without leaving a trace on her pure life how could she lend a rescuing hand to snatch vera from the precipice she who had no faith in passion but had merely sought to understand facts the shots in the depth of the precipice and vera's expeditions were indeed facts against which tatiana markovna might be able to adopt measures she might double the watch kept on the property set men to watch for the lover while vera shut up in the house endured humiliation and a fresh kind of suffering vera would not endure any such rough constraint and would make her escape just as she fled across the volga from raisky there would be in fact no means at all for she had outgrown tatiana markovna's circle of experience and morals no authority might serve with marfinka but not with the clear-headed independent vera such were raisky's thoughts as he walked silently by vera's side no longer desiring full knowledge for his own sake but for her salvation perhaps he thought he would best gain his end by indirect efforts to make her betray herself leonti said he began that you have been reading books out of my library did you read them with him sometimes he told me of the contents of certain books others i read with the priest natasha's husband what books did you read with the priest for the moment i don't remember but he read the writings of the fathers for instance and explained them to natasha and me to my great advantage we also read with him voltaire and spinoza why do you laugh she asked looking at raisky there seems a remarkable gap between the fathers and spinoza and voltaire the encyclopedists are also included in my library did you read them nikolai ivanovitch read some to us and talked about others did you also occupy yourselves with feuerbach with the socialists and the materialists yes natasha's husband asked us to copy out passages which he indicated by pencil marks what was his object in this i think he was preparing to publish a refutation where did you obtain the newer books that are not in the library not the exile he suggested as she gave no answer who lives here under police supervision the same man about whom you wrote to me but you are not listening yes i am who gave me the books sometimes one person sometimes another here in the town volokov borrowed these books perhaps so i had them from professors the thought flashed through raisky's head that there might be other professors of the same kind as monsieur Charles. but he merely asked what were the views of nikolai ivanovich on spinoza and these other writers he says replied vera that these writings are the efforts of bold minds to evade the truth they have beaten out for themselves side paths which must in the end unite with the main road he says too that all these attempts serve the cause of truth in that the truth shines out with greater splendor in the end but he does not tell you where the truth lies by the way once she pointed to the little chapel now in sight and you think he is right i don't think i believe and don't you also believe he is right he agreed and she asked him why that being so he had asked her i wanted he said to know your opinion but you have often seen me at prayer said vera uh, yes but i do not overhear your prayers do you pray for the alleviation of the restless sorrow that afflicts your mind they had reached the chapel and vera stood still for a moment she did not appear to have heard his question and she answered only with a deep sigh it was growing dark as they retraced their steps vera's growing slower and more uncertain as they approached the old house where she stood still and glanced in the direction of the precipice 
to still the storm i must not go near the precipice you say i beg of you to stand by me for i am sick and helpless will not grandmother know better how to help you vera confide in her a woman who will perhaps understand your pain she shook her head i will tell you grandmother and you but not now now i cannot and yet i beg of you not to leave me not to allow me out of your sight if a shot summons me keep me away from the precipice and if necessary hold me back by force things are as bad as that with me that is all you can do for me that is why i asked you not to go away because i felt that my strength is failing because except you i have no one to help me for grandmother would not understand forgive me you did right vera he replied deeply moved depend on me i am willing to stay here forever if that will bring you peace no in a week's time the shots will cease she dried her eyes and pressed his hand then with slow uneven steps supporting herself by the balustrade she passed up the steps and into the house end of chapter twenty one Chapter Twenty Two of The Precipice by Ivan Goncharov, translated by M. Bryant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Two days had passed, and Raisky had had small opportunity of seeing Vera alone, though she came to dinner and to tea, and spoke of ordinary things. Raisky turned once more to his novel, or rather to the plan of it. He visited Leonti and did not neglect the governor and other friends, but in order to keep watch on Vera, he wandered about the park and the garden. Two days were now gone, he thought, since he sat on the bench by the precipice, but there were still five days of danger. Marfinka's birthday lay two days ahead, and on that day Vera would hardly leave the family circle. On the next, Marfinka was to go with her fiancé and his mother to Kolchina, and Vera would not be likely to leave Tatiana Markovna alone. By that time the week would be over and the threatening clouds dispersed. After dinner Vera asked him to come over to her in the evening, as she wished him to undertake a commission for her. When he arrived she suggested a walk, and, as she chose the direction of the fields he realized that she wished to go to the chapel and took the field path accordingly as she crossed the threshold she looked up at the thoughtful face of the christ you have sought more powerful aid than mine said raisky moreover you will not now go there without me she nodded in assent she seemed to be seeking strength sympathy and support from the glance of the crucified but his eyes kept their expression of quiet thought and detachment when she turned her eyes from the picture she reiterated i will not go raisky read on her face neither prayer nor desire it wore an expression of weariness indifference and submission he suggested that they should return and reminded her that she had a commission for him will you take the bouquet holder that i chose the other week for marfinka's birthday to the goldsmith she said handing him her purse i gave him some pearls to set in it and her name should be engraved and could you be up as early as eight o'clock on her birthday of course if necessary i can stay up all night i have already spoken to the gardener who owns the big orangery would you choose me a nice bouquet and send it to me i have confidence in your taste your confidence in me makes progress vera he laughed you already trust my taste and my honour i would have seen to all this myself she went on but i have not the strength next day raisky took the bouquet holder 
and discussed the arrangement of the flowers with the gardener he himself bought for marfinka an elegant watch and chain with two hundred roubles which he borrowed from tit nikonich for tatiana markovna would not have given him so much money for the purpose and would have betrayed the secret in tit nikonich's room he found a dressing-table decked with muslin and lace with a mirror encased in a china frame of flowers and cubits a beautiful specimen of sevra work where did you get the treasure cried raisky who could not take his eyes from the thing what a lovely piece it is my gift for marfa vasilievna said tit nikonich with his kind smile i am glad it pleases you for you are a connoisseur your liking for it assures me that the dear birthday child will appreciate it as a wedding gift she is a lovely girl just like these roses the cupids will smile when they see her charming face in the mirror please don't tell tatiana markovna of my secret this beautiful piece must have cost over two thousand roubles and you cannot possibly have bought it here my grandfather gave five thousand roubles for it and it was part of my mother's house furnishing and until now it stood in her bedroom left untouched in my birthplace it had been brought here last month and to make sure it should not be broken six men carried it in alternate shifts for the whole hundred and fifty versts i had a new muslin cover made but the lace is old you will notice how yellow it is ladies like these things although they don't matter to us what will grandmother say there will be a storm i do feel rather uneasy about it but perhaps she will forgive me i may tell you boris pavlovich that i love both the girls as if they were my own daughters i held them on my knee as babies and with tatiana markovna gave them their first lessons i tell you in confidence that i have also arranged a wedding present for vera vasilievna which i hope she will like when the time comes he showed raisky a magnificent antique silver dinner service of fine workmanship for twelve persons i may confess to you as you are her cousin that in agreement with tatiana markovna i have a splendid and a rich marriage in view for her for whom nothing can be too good the finest party in the neighbourhood he said in a confidential tone is ivan ivanovitch tushin who is absolutely devoted to her as he well may be raisky repressed a sigh and went home where he found Vikentiev and his mother, who had arrived for Marfinka's birthday, with Polina Karpovna and other guests from the town, who stayed until nearly seven o'clock. Tatiana Markovna and Marfa Yegorovna carried on an interminable conversation about Marfinka's trousseau and house furnishing. The lovers went into the garden, and from there to the village. Vikentiev, carrying a parcel which he threw in the air and caught again as he walked. Marfinka entered every house, said goodbye to the women, and caressed the children. In two cases she washed the children's faces. She distributed calico for shirts and dresses, and told two elder children to whom she presented shoes that it was time they gave up paddling in the puddles god reward you our lovely mistress angel of god cried the women in every yard as she bade them farewell for a fortnight end of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of the precipice by ivan goncharov translated by m bryant this librivox recording is in the public domain in the evening the house was aglow with light tatiana markovna could not do enough in honour of her guest and future connection she had a great bed put up in the guest chamber that nearly reached to the ceiling and resembled a catafalque marfinka and vikentiev gave full rein to their gay humour as they played and sang 
Only Reisky's windows were dark. He had gone out immediately after dinner and had not returned to tea. The moon illuminated the new house but left the old house in shadow. There was bustle in the yard, in the kitchen and in the servants' rooms, where Marfa Yegorovna's coachman and servants were being entertained. From seven o'clock onwards, Vera had sat idle in the dusk by the feeble light of a candle, her head supported on her hand, leaning over the table, while with her other hand she turned over the leaves of a book at which she hardly glanced. She was protected from the cold autumn air from the open window by a big white woolen shawl thrown round her shoulders. She stood up after a time, laid the book on the table, and went to the window. She looked towards the sky and then at the gaily lighted house opposite. She shivered and was about to shut the window when the report of a gun rolled up from the park through the quiet dusk. She shuddered and seemed to have lost the use of her limbs, then sank into a chair and bowed her head. When she rose and looked wildly round, her face had changed. Sheer fright and distress looked from her eyes. Again and again she passed her hand over her forehead and sat down at the table, only to jump up again. She tore the shawl from her shoulders and threw it on the bed. Then, with nervous haste, she opened and shut the cupboard. She looked on the divan, on the chairs, for something she apparently could not find, and then collapsed wearily on her chair. On the back of the chair hung a wrap, a gift from Tit Nikonich. She seized it and threw it over her head, rushed to the wardrobe, hunted in it with feverish haste, taking out first one coat, then another, until she had nearly emptied the cupboard, and dresses and cloaks lay in a heap on the floor. At last she found something warm and dark, put out the light, and went noiselessly down the steps into the open. She crossed the yard, hidden in the shadows, and took her way along the dark avenue. She did not walk, she flew, and when she crossed the open light patches her shadow was hardly visible for a moment, as if the moon had not time to catch the flying figure. When she reached the end of the avenue by the ditch, which divided the garden from the park, she stopped a moment to get her breath. Then she crossed the park, hurried through the bushes, passed her favorite bench, and reached the precipice. She picked up her skirts for the descent, when suddenly, as if he had risen out of the ground, Reisky stood between her and her goal. Where are you going, Vera? There was no answer. Go back, he said, offering his hand, but she tried to push past him. Vera, where are you going? It is for the last time, she said in a pleading, shamed whisper. I must say goodbye. Make way for me, cousin. I will return in a moment. Wait for me here on this bench. Without replying, he took her firmly by the hand, and she struggled in vain to free herself. Let me go. You are hurting me. But he did not give way, and the struggle proceeded. You will not hold me by force she cried and with unnatural strength freed herself and sought to dash past him but he put his arm round her waist took her to the bench and sat down beside her how rough and rude she cried i cannot hold you back by force vera i may be saving you from ruin can i be ruined against my own will it is against your will yet you go to your ruin there is no question of ruin we must see one another again in order to separate. It is not necessary to see one another in order to separate. I must and will. An hour or a day later it is all the same. You may call the servants, the whole town, a file of soldiers, but no power will keep me back. A second shot resounded. She pulled herself up, but was pressed down on the bench with the weight of Reisky's hands. She shook her head wildly in powerless rage. What reward do you hope from me for this virtuous deed? She hissed. He said nothing but kept a watchful eye on her movements. After a time she besought him gently. Let me go, 
cousin but he refused cousin she said laying her hand gently on his shoulder imagine that you sat upon hot coals and were dying every minute of terror and of wild impatience that happiness rose before you stretching out enticing arms only to vanish that your whole being rose to meet it imagine that you saw before you a last hope a last glimmer that is how it is with me at this moment the moment will be lost and with it everything else think vera if in the hot thirst of fever you ask for ice it is denied you in your soberer moments yesterday you pointed out to me the practical means of rescue you said i was not to let you go and i will not she fell on her knees before him and wrung her hands i should curse you my whole life long for your violence give way perhaps it is my destiny that calls me i was a witness yesterday vera of where you seek your fate you believe in a providence and there is no other destiny yes she answered submissively i do believe there before the sacred picture i sought for a spark to lighten my path but in vain what shall i do she said rising do not go vera perhaps it is my destiny that sends me there there where my presence may be needed don't try any longer to keep me for i have made up my mind my weakness is gone and i have recovered control of myself and feel i am strong it is not my destiny alone but the destiny of another human being that is to be decided down there between me and him you are digging an abyss and the responsibility will rest upon you i shall never be consoled and shall accuse you of having destroyed our happiness do not hold me back you can only do it out of egoism out of jealousy you lied when you spoke to me of freedom i hear the voice of passion vera with all its sophistry and its deviations you are practising the arts of a jesuit remember that you yourself bade me only yesterday not to leave you will you curse me for not yielding to you on whom does the responsibility rest tell me who the man is if i tell you will you promise not to keep me back she said quickly i don't know perhaps give me your word not to keep me any longer and i give the name another shot rang out she sprang to one side before he had time to take her by the hand go to grandmother he commanded adding gently tell her your trouble for christ's sake let me go i ask for alms like a beggar i must be free i take him to whom i prayed yesterday to witness that i am going for the last time do you hear i will not break my oath wait here for me i will return immediately will only say farewell to the wolf will hear a word from him and perhaps he will yield she rushed forward fell to the ground in her haste and tried in vain to rise torn by an unutterable pity raisky took no heed of his own suffering but raised her in his arms and bore her down the precipice the path is so steep here that you would fall again he whispered presently he set her down on the path and she stooped to kiss his hand you are generous cousin vera will not forget with that she hurried into the thicket jubilant as a bird set free from his cage raisky heard the rustle of the bushes as she pushed them aside and the crackle of the dry twigs in the half-ruined arbor waited mark with gun and cap laid upon the table he walked up and down on the shaky floor and whenever he trod on one end of a board the other rose in the air and then fell clattering back again the devil's music he murmured angrily sat down on a bench near the table and pushed his hands through his thick hair he smoked one cigarette after another the burning match lighting up his pale agitated face for a moment after each shot he listened for a few minutes went out on the steps and looked out into the bushes 
When he returned, he walked up and down, raising the devil's music once more, threw himself on the bench, and ran his hands through his hair. After the third shot, he listened long and earnestly. As he heard nothing, he was on the point of going away. To relieve his gloomy feelings, he murmured a curse between his teeth, took the gun, and prepared to descend the path. He hesitated a few moments longer, then walked off with decision. Suddenly he met Vera. She stood still, breathing with difficulty, and laid her hand on her heart. As soon as he took her hand, she was calm. Mark could not conceal his joy, but his words of greeting did not betray it. You used to be punctual, Vera, he said, and I used not to have to waste three shots. A reproach instead of a welcome, she said, drawing her hand away. It's only by way of beginning a conversation happiness makes a fool of me, like Reisky. If happiness gleamed before us, we should not be meeting in secret by this precipice, she said, drawing a long breath. We should be sitting at your grandmother's tea table and waiting till someone arranged our betrothal. Why dream of these impossible things? Your grandmother would not give you to me. She would. She does what I wish. That is not the hindrance. You are starting on this endless polemic again, Vera. We are meeting for the last time as you determined we should. Let us make an end of this torture. I took an oath never to come here again. Meanwhile, the time is precious. We are parting forever, if stupidity commands, if your grandmother's antiquated convictions separate us. I leave here a week from now. As you know, the document assuring my freedom has arrived. Let us be together and not be separated again. Never? Never, he repeated angrily with a gesture of impatience. What lying words those are, never and always. Of course, never. Does not a year, perhaps two, three years, mean never? You want a never-ending tenderness. Does such a thing exist? Enough, Mark. I have heard enough of this temporary affection. Ah! I am very unhappy. The separation from you is not the only cloud over my soul. For a year now I have been hiding myself from my grandmother, which oppresses me and her still more. I hoped that in these days my trouble would end. We should put our thoughts, our hopes, our intentions on a clear footing. Then I would go to grandmother and say, this is what I have chosen for my whole life, but it is not to be, and we are to part, she asked sadly. If I conceived myself to be an angel, said Mark, I might say, for our whole lives, and you would be justified. That grey-headed dreamer, Reisky, also thinks that women are created for a higher purpose. They are created above all for the family. They are not angels, neither are they most certainly mere animals. I'm no wolf's mate, Mark, but a woman. For the family, yes. But is that any hindrance for us? You want draperies, for fine feelings, sympathies, and the rest of the stuff are nothing but draperies, like those famous leaves with which... It is said human beings covered themselves in paradise. Yes, Mark, human beings. Mark smiled sarcastically and shrugged his shoulders. They may be draperies, continued Vera, but they also, according to your own teaching, are given by nature. What I ask is it that attaches you to me? You say you love me. You have altered, grown thinner. Is it not by your conception of love a matter of indifference whether you choose a companion in me or from the poor quarter of our town or from a village on the Volga? What has induced you to come down here for a whole year? Examine your own fallacy, Vera, he said, looking at her gloomily. Love is not a concept merely, but a driving force, a necessity, and therefore is mostly blind. 
but I am not blindly chained to you. Your extraordinary beauty, your intellect, and your free outlook hold me longer in thrall than would be possible with any other woman. Very flattering, she said in a low, pained voice. These ideas of yours, Vera, will bring us to disaster. But for them we should for long have been united and happy, happy for a time. And then a new driving force will appear on the scene, the stage will be cleared, and so on. The responsibility is not ours. Nature has ordered it so, and rightly. Can we alter nature in order to live on concepts? These concepts are essential principles. You have said yourself that nature has her laws, and human beings their principles. That is where the germ of disintegration lies, in that men want to formulate principles from the driving force of nature, and thus to hamper themselves hand and foot. Love is happiness which nature has conferred on man. That is my view. The happiness of which you speak, said Vera, rising, has as its complement duty. That is my view. How fantastic! Forget your duty, Vera, and acquiesce in the fact that love is a driving force of nature, often an uncontrollable one. Then, standing up to her, embraced her, saying, Is that not so, you most obstinate, beautiful, and wisest of women? Yes, duty, she said haughtily, disengaging herself. For the years of happiness retribution will be exacted. How? In making soup, nursing one another, looking at one another, and pretending, in harping on principles as we ourselves fade? If one half falls ill and retrogresses, shall the other, who is strong, who hears the call of life, allow himself to be held back by duty? Yes, in that case he must not listen to the calls that come to him. He must, to use grandmother's expression, avoid the voice as he would the brandy bottle. That is how I understand happiness. Your case must be a bad one, if it has to be bolstered up by quotations from your grandmother's wisdom. Tell me how firmly your principles are rooted. I will go to her today, direct from here. To tell her what? To tell her what there is between us. All that she does not know, she said, sitting down on the bench again. Why? You don't understand, because you don't know what duty means. I have been guilty before her for a long time. That is the morality which smothers life with mold and dullness. Vera, Vera, you don't love. You do not know how. You ought not to speak like that unless you wish to drive me to despair. Am I to think that there is deception in your past, that you want to ruin me when you do not love me? No, no, Vera, he said, rising hastily to his feet. If I had wanted to deceive you, I would have done so long ago. What a desperate war you wage against yourself, Mark, and how you ruin your own life, she cried, wringing her hands. Let us cease to quarrel, Vera. Your grandmother speaks through you, but with another voice. That was all very well once, but now we are in the flood of another life, where neither authority nor preconceived ideas will help us, where truth alone asserts her power. Where is truth? In happiness, in the joy of love. And I love you. Why do you torture me? Why do you fight against me and against yourself and make two victims? It is a strange reproach. Look at me. It is only a few days since we saw one another, and have I not changed? I see that you suffer, and that makes it the more senseless. Now I too ask, what has induced you to come down here for all this time? Because I had not earlier realized the horror of my position. You will say, she said with a look that was almost hostile, we might have asked one another this question and made this reproach long ago. 
and might have ceased to meet here. Better late than never. Today we must answer the question. What is it that we wanted and expected from one another? Here is my irrefragable opinion. I want your love, and I give you mine. In love I recognize solely the principle of reciprocation as it obtains in nature. The law that I acknowledge is to follow unfettered our strong impression to exchange happiness for happiness. This answers your question of why I came here. Is sacrifice necessary? Call it what you will, there is no sacrifice in my scheme of life. I will no longer wander in this morass, and don't understand how I have wasted my strength so long, certainly not for your sake, but essentially for my own. Here I will stay so long as I am happy, so long as I love. If my love grows cold, I shall tell you so, and go wherever life leads me, without taking any baggage of duties and privileges with me. Those I leave here, in the depths below the precipice. You see, Vera, I don't deceive you, but speak frankly. Naturally, you possess the same rights as I. The mob above there lies to itself and others, and calls this his principles. But in secret and by cunning it acts in the same way, and only lays its ban on the women. Between us there must be equality. Is that fair or not? Sophistry, she said, shaking her head. You know my principles, Mark. To hang like stones round one another's necks. Love imposes duties, just as life demands them. If you had an old blind mother, you would maintain and support her, would remain by her. An honorable man holds it to be his duty and his pleasure, too. You philosophize, Vera, but you do not love. You avoid my argument, Mark. I speak my opinion plainly, for I am a woman, not an animal, or a machine. Your love is the fantastic, elaborate type described in novels. Is what you ask of me honorable? Against my convictions I am to go into a church to submit to a ceremony which has no meaning for me. I don't believe any of it and can't endure the parson. Should I be acting logically or honorably? Vera hastily wrapped herself in her mantilla and stood up to go. We met Mark, to remove all the obstacles that stand in the way of our happiness, but instead of that we are increasing them. You handle roughly things that are sacred to me. Why do you call me here? I thought you had surrendered, that we should take one another's hands forever. Every time I have taken the path down the cliff it has been in this hope, and in the end I am disappointed. Do you know, Mark, where the true life lies? Where? In the heart of a loving woman. To be the friend of such a woman, tears stifled her voice, but through her sobs she whispered, I cannot, Mark. Neither my intellect nor my strength are sufficient to dispute with you. My weapon is weak and has no value except that I have drawn it from the armory of a quiet life, not from books or hearsay. I had thought to conquer you with other weapons. Do you remember how all this began? She said, sitting down once more. At first I was sorry for you. You were here alone, with no one to understand you, and everyone fled at the sight of you. I was drawn to you by sympathy, and saw something strange and undisciplined in you. You had no care for propriety, you were incautious in speech, you played rashly with life, cared for no human being, had no faith of your own, and sought to win disciples. From curiosity I followed your steps, allowed you to meet me, took books from you. I recognized in you intellect and strength, but strangely mixed and directed away from life. Then to my sorrow I imagined that I would teach you to value life. I wanted you to live so 
that you should be higher and better than any one else i quarrelled with you over your undisciplined way of living you submitted to my influence and i submitted to yours to your intellect your audacity and even adopted part of your sophistry but you soon put in mark retraced your steps and were seized with fear of your grandmother why did you not leave me when you first became aware of my sophistry sophistry it was too late for i had already taken your fate too intimately to heart i believed with all possible ardour that you would for my sake comprehend life that you would cease to wander about to your own injury and without advantage to any one else that you would accept a substantial position of some kind vice-governor counsellor or something of the kind he mocked what's in the name yes i thought that you would show yourself a man of action in a wide sphere of influence as a well-disposed subject and as jack of all trades and what else my lifelong friend i let my hopes of you take hold on me and was carried away by them and what are my gains in the terrible conflict one only that you flee from love from happiness from life and from your vera she drew closer to him and touched his shoulder don't fly from us mark look in my eyes listen to my voice which speaks with the voice of truth let us go to-morrow up the hill into the garden and to-morrow there will be no happier pair than we are you love me mark mark do you hear look at me she stooped and looked into his eyes he got sharply to his feet and shook his mass of hair vera took up her black mantilla once more but her hands refused to obey her and the mantilla fell on the floor she took a step towards the door but sank down again on the bench where could she find strength to hold him when she had not even strength to leave the arbor she wondered and even if she could hold him what would be the consequences not one life but two separate lives two prisons divided by a grating we are both brusque and strong vera that is why we torture one another why we are separating if i were strong you would not leave malinovka you would ascend the hill with me not clandestinely but boldly by my side come and share life and happiness with me is it impossible that you should not trust me impossible that you are insincere for that would be a crime what shall i do how shall i bring home to you the truth you would have to be stronger than i but we are of equal strength that is why we dispute and are not of one mind we must separate without bringing our struggle to an issue one must submit to the other i could take forcible possession of you as i could of any other woman but what in another woman is prudery or pretty fear or stupidity is in you strength and womanly determination the mist that divided us is dispersed we have made our position clear nature has endued you with a powerful weapon vera the antiquated ideas morality duty principles and faiths that do not exist for me are firmly established with you you are not easily carried away you put up a desperate fight and will only confess yourself conquered under terms of equality with your opponent you are wrong for it is a kind of theft you ask to be conquered and to carry off all the spoils i vera cannot give everything but i respect you vera gave him a glance in which there was a trace of pride but her heart beat with the pain of parting his words were a model of what a farewell should be we have gone to the bottom of the matter said mark dully and i leave the decision in your hands he went to the other side of the arbor 
keeping his eyes fixed upon her i am not deceiving you even now in this decisive moment when my head is giddy i cannot i do not promise you an unending love because i do not believe in such a thing i will not be your betrothed but i love you more than anything else in the world if after all i have told you you come to my arms it means that you love me that you are mine she looked across at him with wide open eyes and felt that her whole body was trembling a doubt shot through her mind was he a jesuit or was the man who brought her into this dangerous dilemma in reality of unbending honor yours forever she said in a low voice if he said yes it would she knew be a bridge for the moment to help her over the abyss that divided them but that afterwards she would be plunged into the abyss she was afraid of him mark was painfully agitated but he answered in a subdued tone i do not know i only know what i am doing now and do not see even into the near future neither can you let us give love for love and i remain here quieter than the waters of the pool humbler than grass i will do what you will and what do you ask more or he added suddenly coming nearer we will leave this place altogether in a lightning flash the wide world seemed to smile before her as if the gates of paradise were open she threw herself in mark's arms and laid her hand on his shoulder if she went away into the far distance with him she thought he could not tear himself from her and once alone with her he must realize that life was only life in her presence will you decide he asked seriously she said nothing but bowed her head or do you fear your grandmother the last words brought her to her senses and she stepped back if i do not decide she whispered it is only because i fear her the old lady would not let you go she would let me go and would give me her blessing but she herself would die of grief that is what i fear to go away together she said dreamily and what then she looked up at him searchingly and then how can i know vera you will suddenly be driven from me you will go and leave me as if i were merely a log why a log we could separate as friends separation do the ideas of love and separation exist side by side in your mind they are extremes which should never meet separation must only come with death farewell mark you can never promise me the happiness that i seek all is at an end farewell farewell vera he said in a voice quite unlike his own both were pale and avoided one another's eyes in the white moonlight that gleamed through the trees vera sought her mantilla and grasped the gun instead at last she found the mantilla but could not put it on her shoulders mark helped her mechanically but left his own belongings behind they went silently up the path with slow and hesitating steps as if each expected something from the other both of them occupied with the same mental effort to find a pretext for delay they came at last to the spot where mark's way lay across a low fence and hers by the winding path through the bushes up to the park vera stood still she seemed to see the events of her whole life pass before her in quick succession but saw none filled with bitterness like the present her eyes filled with tears she felt a violent impulse to look round once more to see him once more to measure with her eyes the extent of her loss and then to hurry on again but however great her sorrow for her wrecked happiness she dare not look round for she knew 
it would be equivalent to saying yes to destiny. She took a few steps up the path. Mark strode fiercely away towards the hedge like a wild beast balked of his prey. He had not lied when he said that he esteemed Vera, but it was an esteem wrung from him against his will, the esteem of the soldier for a brave enemy. He cursed the old-fashioned ideas which had enchained her free and vivacious spirit. His suffering was the suffering of despair. He was in the mood of a madman who would shatter a treasure of which the possession was denied him, in order that no one else might possess it. He was ready to spring and could hardly restrain himself from laying violent hands on Vera. By his own confession to her, he would have treated any other woman so, but not Vera. Then the conviction gnawed at his heart that for the sake of the woman, who was now escaping him, he was neglecting his mission. His pride suffered unspeakably by the confession of his own powerlessness. He admitted that the beautiful statue, filled with the breath of life, had character. She acted in accordance with her own proud will, not by the influence of outside suggestion. His new conception of truth did not subdue her strong, healthy temperament. It rather induced her to submit it to a minute analysis and to stick closer to her own conception of the truth. And now she was going, and as the traces of her footsteps would vanish, so all that had passed between them would be lost. And with her went all the charm and glory of life, never to return. He stamped his feet with rage and swung himself on to the fence. He would cast one glance in her direction to see if the haughty creature was really going. One more glance, thought Vera. She turned and shuddered to see Mark sitting on the fence and gazing at her. Farewell, Mark, she cried in a voice trembling with despair. From his throat there issued a low, wild cry of triumph. In a moment he was by her side with victory and the conviction of her surrender in his heart. Vera, you have come back for always. You have at last understood. What happiness! God forgive! She did not complete her sentence, for she lay wrapped in his embrace, her sobs quenched by his kisses. He raised her in his arms, and like a wild animal carrying off his prey, ran with her back to the arbor. God forgive her for having turned back. End of chapter 23